begin by saying that the, 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 the first slide on the slide, that the macroeconomists have learned much since 1929, and the world is significantly better for that. I'm about to start a sketch of thoughts about where I think macroeconomic theory should go next. That's to say, to, to, as part of it, as, as Andreas suggested, an ambitious project to, to have, have whatever little models I can work on be part of, of understanding more deeply uh, what should economics be about. Um, but I want to start by, by acknowledging that I'm not a macroeconomist, and that there aren't many academic fields where you can say, you know, human welfare on planet Earth is significant. Better. Obviously, medical advances are in that, that category, but, but, but uh, can we say about many branches of social science that, uh, that human welfare is really significantly better because of uh, academic papers that have been written in, in, say, in the last hundred years? Uh, in macroeconomics, I think it's true. We, we responded to a, a, a rolling financial crisis, fiscal financial crisis since 2008, uh, much better than the world responded to some crises in Earth around 1929 uh, because macroeconomic policy uh, based on new decades of academic research uh, macroeconomists understand better how to handle the macro stabilization problem better but we clearly do not know enough we need to learn more and, uh, and every everybody in the room in the economics is an economist it's a part of our job is to speculate uh, and I would like to share with you some thoughts that we know about right from the literature and some guesses about where the literature should go next to have to learn because clearly our macroeconomic management is is, is is not what it should be. It, it hopefully will be much better. So I'm going to explain why I think we should look to information economics and in your introduction highlight the fact that I think information economics is central to what to understanding what economics is, like the economic question. Um, I want to highlight why I think more people take the moral hazard agency theory in information economics as is where we should look for the deeper understanding of, of, of the, and, and whether I'm right or not the, the macroeconomists among them will be the critics to judge me. The key thing historically I want to mark is that the, 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 the foundations of theory have come a long way since Keynes and, and Milton Friedman uh, and Irving Fisher, but as they founded modern macroeconomic theory, their work predated the information economics revolution in the 1970s, which depended on game theory. Uh, I think I'm happy to acknowledge the picture of Ben Bernanke and Mark Gertler as being one of the early attempts to write a macro model that was explicitly, a macroeconomic stabilization model that was explicitly based on agency theory uh, uh, ideas. And the date in the 1980s is pretty quick, within a decade after the major advances and the fundamental advances information economics, which, which I was one of many participants, um, but uh, uh, I think it's only since 2008 that I think there's been a broad sense that uh, maybe we should not be too content with, with what we understand about macroeconomic uh, theory. Let me begin um, with, with a few back to the general theory. In the last couple of years, I have reread cover to cover with John Maynard Keynes' general theory of employment, interest, and money. To, because I wanted to look for where in there does he actually discuss the fact uh, that the Great Depression uh, uh, spread around the world from phenomena of bank failures in many countries? Uh, and the answer is no, there isn't. The word moral hazard does appear somewhere in chapter 11, I think, of, of Keynesian <coughs> theory, but it doesn't seem to get tied into um, anything, but in, in, in any of his real theories.
fluctuations in general employment are, are being driven by fluctuations in investment. Where does he say that banks, which are financial institutions to channel savings to investment, intrinsically matter? And couldn't find it anywhere in the general theory. Obviously, it's hard to read. Maybe somebody who sort of better can tell me where it is. But if you're skimming the treatise on money, it does, when you get to the 62 volumes, I, mean, yes, I think it's chapter 37, the second to last chapter of the last volume, there's a large subsection that's entitled, Can the Banking System Affect the Rate of Investment? So there it is. That's where he addresses the question at the spot on. And when you start reading the things he starts talking about credit rationing. He says, there is normally a fringe of unsatisfied borrowers to whom the bank would be quite ready to lend if it were to find itself in a position to lend more. The existence of this unsatisfied fringe of completely qualified borrowers allows this is capital banking, capital system, but the bank system means the, the central bank, the monetary authorities, allows the monetary authorities a, a means, a way of influencing the rate of investment, it means the amount of investment, supplementary to mere changes in the short term rate of interest. So he's saying the monetary policy that enables banks to lend more can get more safe, more investment going on, even without the interest rate change. Where is that in the general theory? There's all this stuff on the liquidity trap where monetary policy is supposed to work through the interest rate, but, but here he's saying, no, you don't have to change the interest rate, you just have to get the bottom lending. Why did he omit this vital? So in 1930, he says something, something that he thinks is central to understanding the then early years of the, the beginning of the Great Depression. And yet he leaves it out of his general theory. Why? Because credit rationing would have seemed indefensible for the theoretical tools that he had in 1936. John B. M. Keynes, and this is, he's, I can just see him puffing on his pipe and he's saying, you know, I know more about banking than, than, than when Myers is born and when he's old, he still won't know as much banking as I, John and Maynard Keynes would ever know, any of these smart guys, and I know about this stuff. But then when he was writing in 1936, he's writing a theory. And he's writing a theory, he get the obvious question is, if, so many, if banks have all these perfectly qualified borrowers who are eager to borrow, but they don't have enough money, why would the banks say, oh, We'll lend it in the higher, who wants to pay a higher interest rate? That's the theory, price theory. Any price theory says you can't have a short, you know, a, 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 a short supply in the market. You should just look at the supply equals demand, because if it doesn't, then they raise the price. So he couldn't explain it. That's because he was born too early to read Stiglitz and Weiss. Uh, 1981, Stiglitz and Weiss, you know, credit ration may have seemed theoretically defensible in 1936, but in 1981, Joe Stiglitz and Andy Weiss derived it both from moral hazard and, and, and adverse selection arguments. <coughs> so let me review the adverse selection, I'm sorry, the moral hazard arguments. Uh, one of the nice things about that 1981 paper, early in the years of information economics, is that it does look at both things from both, both moral hazard and adverse selection perspective. But basically the story, the moral hazard story is this one. The entrepreneur, an entrepreneur borrows from a bank to finance an invention. The probability of this, this venture might succeed or it might fail. The probability of success depends on the entrepreneur working hard. He's got to, when, when his kids are sick, he still has to go to the shop and try to get them. He works evenings and weekends. He doesn't talk to his family. He's, you know, he's successful. And, but then there's some possible, this, by all these efforts, and the banker doesn't want to follow him around day and night to find out whether he's, whether he's at the shop or whether he's uh, uh, relaxing sometimes, taking a little time off. No, the bank wants to just can't fall. So, so if the bank charged higher than what motivates the entrepreneur to work as hard as so many entrepreneurs do, is that you can make a lot of money if it succeeds. Now, when you raise the interest rate and, and say, ah, you don't have to pay me if, you're, if, 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 if your venture fails, you're going to go bankrupt, you're not going to be able to pay me anything, so it doesn't matter how much you say you won't pay, uh, how much you owe the bank. But if you succeed, you're going to pay more. If we raise the interest rate, we are cutting back on the profits in the event of success. Cutting back the entrepreneur's profits in the event of success reduces the entrepreneur's incentive to stay up late and work weekends to make the project a success. So this need to, to, to give entrepreneurs enough, to give the borrowers enough profits to motivate them to work hard to make a success a highly likely event, that imposes an upper bound on the interest you can charge. If you charge higher interest, they just wouldn't work as hard to have more failures than the moral hazard story. So interest rates might not rise even when there are qualified, equally qualified, eager borrowers uh, and can't find funds at the going at the going interest rate. That's credit rationing. Depends on the moral hazard. So I've already used these terms in, 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 in a public.
lecture in honor of Max Weber, I should make sure I define properly the terms. Problems of game. When people enter into a transaction with some understanding that when in this transaction, each of them will do certain things, uh, hit certain actions that are hard for the others to want to monitor, such as the entrepreneur is borrowed from the bank, but an understanding that the entrepreneur, uh, that this person who's starting a business with the bank's money, will work very hard to make it a success, work evenings and weekends, as well as uh, five days a week during the day, uh, in order to make it a success. Uh, the problem of making, giving people an incentive to choose their actions, their hidden actions, appropriately to what was understood in the terms of the transaction, those problems are called the moral hazard. Comes from the insurance industry. It was afraid that if you overinsure people against risks, they then don't worry. They don't want to exert much as much effort at protecting themselves against the possibility of, of, of a risk of car accident or of, of, of their household. Problems of getting people to share hidden information, honestly, when are called adverse selection. Uh, again, from the insurance industry, it was afraid that if they start insuring people against a certain kind of, of say, health risk, they may get people. Signing up to buy it, who uh, know that they are actually at a greater risk of, of this disease, perhaps. So, such problems having agents with different information or analyzing information technologies, which developed, say, in the 1970s based on earlier advances in game theory. Banks and other financial intermediaries earn their money by having better information about investments than their depositors do, either because they know how to identify where the investments are or Good were good investments, or because they're, they're more able to supervise entrepreneurs. Either way, the banks have to know something about the investments that the depositors don't, and that's why the banks can lend at a high rate and, 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 and borrow at a low rate. I love this quote from Charlie uh, Fraisius uh, and Jean Charles Rocher, and I gave it in the new edition of the book, but in the 1997 uh, edition of the book, they referred back 20 years ago, it's the late 1970s, they say 20 years ago, there was a I'm sorry, the title of the book, I think, is Microeconomics of Banking. Uh, and they said, that you, you couldn't have had a microeconomic theory of banking before information economics, because before that, the, the asymmetric information paradigm is, is, used, is, is necessary for us to understand the role of banks and point out weaknesses in the banking sector. And of course, that's my point. Is, 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 in, in writing their book on, on, on um, microeconomics of banking and observing, Technology to do to write that book, to write such a book was not available before the 1970s. You say, well, wait a minute, where were we? Maybe that has something to do with why Milton Friedman and developing the monetary theory, or, or John Maynard Keynes and developing his macroeconomic theories, systematically under us, uh, try to focus on, 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 on phenomena other than. Think about a small class of people who 
have are experts in, in the potential value of investments. Okay, in particular, any firm has to have great expertise in the investments of its that were, uh, in what's worth it. What are potentially profitable investments in the area of operations? So, when an investment opportunity requires outside finance, I want to quote the paper, the, fund, the paper of Myers and Munch, which was uh, from 1984, early in the years of information, post information economics finance, that, that drew inspiration from George Ackerman, his earlier paper on the winner's curse. So, Myers and Munch will argue that when, when, an when, when the entrepreneur, who, 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 the manager, who, who runs a firm, Industrial business that runs a firm has, a, has an investment opportunity that requires outside financing. We understand that they may choose between raising new funds from the public by issuing debt or by issuing new equity shares. The, adverse, the fundamental adverse selection problem in corporate governance, we should understand, is that they have better information about the productivity of their firm now and in the future, potentially in the future with the new investment, but particularly now. And the public is going to buy any given equity shares based on the announcement of the, the, the new equity issue and whatever else the public knows, but they can't know what the entrepreneur knows. So there's some price at which the, the entrepreneur can raise enough money, let's say, to expand his company's operations uh, uh, at some price at which he can sell a certain number of equity shares uh, to the public. And now he's going to make a decision whether to, to, to promise debt or equity. Well, the answer is, given any market price at which you can sell equity shares, the entrepreneur is more than the manager of the company, the owner of the company is more the manager of the company, is more likely to choose, if he's acting on behalf of the current shareholders, he's more likely to choose to sell equity if he knows that the, the current, that, that, uh, that his private information suggests that his price is too high. That is, when, when, after all, selling equity is selling a share of a fraction of the future profits, and if you know that the future profits are going to be very large, then selling them for a given price is worse for, the, for, for you and the other current owners of the firm. You as the, the manager who's heavily invested in the equity of your own firm and who's acting on behalf of the other current shareholders. Whereas if current profits you know are actually going to be less, then the, the, to sell a fra this, any given fraction of the outsiders at any given price is more attractive. So, you, so the, on the equity versus debt decision, the manager is going to assume the owner manager is going to assume is, going to, is assumed to sell equity when the firm is acting. His private information is, is unfavorable to the future profits of the firm. Now, of course, outside investors should understand that. Therefore, they should infer from the decision to sell, to issue, to raise funds by selling equity uh, that, that probably this is, this is a firm that was less uh, profitable than we thought, uh, which means that we should pay less for it. That becomes so the very decision to sell equity cause an adverse influence that depresses the price of it. That's the basic myers launch of an adverse selection problem. And that's why this, this, the, the problem, this adverse selection means for most normal uh, states of, of private information, entrepreneurs should find debt more favorable than Short-term debt avoids risks of future ad uh, the, 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 the myers launch conclusion formally is that the, 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 the manager is going to be biased towards, towards raising funds by selling uh, promises about whose future value the manager has less private information, and promising a given amount of money, debt is, 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 is the natural solution. So what we should think is, think of a world where our entrepreneurs, our, our, our industrialists, the owners of our firms, and, and, and our captains of industry and finance, have private information about where the good investments are, all of us need to be guided by that so we're, But when we do, they, they are going to have an adverse selection bias towards issuing debt promises, promises to pay a fixed amount of money, rather than paying a fraction of their, of their future profits because of the bias that whenever they offer themselves a fraction of their future profits, which is what equity is, that that probably means that those profits, they have private information that says those profits are not as valuable. But they are borrowers. And as borrowers, we know that the, the more, there's a moral hazard problem. The industrialists also need to work hard to make sure that uh, the project is a success. So when prices, so we know that they have to have a certain amount of skin in the investment. So when price, when prices, well, I want to get to Irving Fisher's debt deflation. Irving Fisher in 1933 
observed that as John Maynard Keynes was trying to come up with his theory of depressions, Irving Fisher in America, uh, in, uh, I think it's one of the early volumes of the, the first volume of the economic era, uh, published a paper where he says, you know what, what really causes a depression is the combination of excessive debt and deflation. This is, was confusing because it's a question of, of how does, um, since debt is, is debt, debts in society must cancel out, the net zero. Uh, anything that, 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 if I owe you money, then I have a big debt, but you also have a negative debt, you have an asset. So, so, what, if, if, so how does deflation change in the price level, which changes the real value if I owe, owe you a thousand euros, uh, an inflation or deflation can change the, value, the real value of that euro? And the answer is, of course, the people who have the best information are going to be issuing debt claims in order to raise money from the rest of us. We have, they have to get money from the rest of us because they're the ones who know where the investment should go. They're becoming indebted to us. But when, if the price level is lower than we expected, then we're going to have a deflation causes a general increase. It causes an increase in the real cost, the real value of the debt industrialists owe us, therefore deflation causes a general decrease in the net wealth of, of the industrialists who's, who must leverage their information only a certain, you know, who have, so, I'm sorry, deflation by increasing the real cost of the, of the debt that the, that the industrialists owe the rest of us in debt, uh, decreases their net wealth. And the point is that, that the wealth of, of entrepreneurs and other informed financial agents becomes a key macro state variable. And this we could call this a balance sheet theory. It's a generalized balance sheet theory of recessions. Uh, it's, and when their net wealth is lower in aggregate, since we only trust them to, have, to, 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 to undertake projects in which they have a certain fraction of investment because they have to have a reason to want to work hard or to, to choose to manage risks in these investments in an appropriate way, uh, they will be subject to moral hazard if they don't have enough investment themselves. Now, when they are excessively indebted, uh, they have to allow real, real investment opportunities to, to get to go by, they have to lose real investment opportunities, and the economy suffers. That's the theory. That's a the theory of how debt, how deflation is going to be. De the, the problem of deflation in this theory is, is that it causes our, our industrialists to be, have real debts of excessively high value or excessively uh, real current value. Of course, that doesn't mean inflation in any. It also means uh, uh, industrialists thinking, when I borrow now, that's going to preclude the, my future borrowing. So I want to allow, this is an opportunity, but I want to take advantage of future opportunities. And they take advantage. If we don't need deflation, we just need that the price level hasn't appreciated by as much as they were expecting when they, when they incurred the debt for them to be making an era, discover exposed to making an era, and made a, a, a bad calculation your ability to invest is less than they expected, less than would have been efficient in a dynamic economy, and therefore the real economy suffers. I want to probe this just a little bit farther. Um, I think this is an important story. I want to talk about it because I want to talk I, as I said, not on, I hope that my paper this morning that I'll mention a little later today briefly, uh, as, 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 uh, as I was introduced from the this morning, I that it might qualify to call myself a macro here in the future, but uh, I'm speculating as a general economic theorist who can't claim to have had a long history of being a macroeconomist about what the future of macroeconomics should be. And I think this is, so this balance sheet recession theory, which I believe in, is that we should be studying. But there's fundamental reasons to think it's wrong. So let me say why. The point of this balance sheet recession theory is when the price level is lower than we would have expected, so that the, the, the real burden of debt is greater than the reformed agents are poorer. And investment on real investment opportunities are lost, unemployment increases, and marginal returns to investment increase. Uh, the productive investment opportunities being lost, that means that there are investment opportunities that have a relatively high marginal productivity that nobody's doing. So that suggests that okay, if the possibility of such an event were anticipated, these agents, these informed agents, these industrialists who we all rely on, would prefer to have their debts the real burden of their debt reduced in such a macroeconomic event. Uh, as, as could be achieved, for example, by inflationary monetary policy. If I have a hello, Frankfurt, I would like to say that, 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 that we should have macroeconomic rules that call for higher 
inflation in situations such as the Eurozone has suffered in, in recent years. So, uh, uh, okay. However, there's a vote, so, so that's the suggestion that when GDP growth is lower than expected, perhaps we should have nominal GDP targeting and the, and the central bank should follow a rule, but not a rule of steady inflation. So rather, when growth is low, it's because the real burden of debt is too great and these industrial states are for net and some relief in aggregate, and we should inflate away some of the costs of the debt. That's a big The problem with that theory is it depends, it's a theory of monetary policy. It's a theory that depends on the industrialists uh, uh, issuing their debt in particular monetary unit. By the way, I guess in Europe it should be euros, and I guess in the United States, if I, if I should expect it to be dollars, but why is a good question. Uh, uh, so the balance sheet theory of recessions, which I think is, a, is a, should, we should think is plausible, it depends on the question, not why is Machel said the, the, the financiers are going to issue debt in a form which they have relatively little information about, but, but, but it, there are many things that they could, and in particular, Sebastian <coughs> Teller a few years ago said, why don't they issue their debt in terms of a broad macroeconomic index? In fact, if I want to advocate uh, a nominal GDP targeting policy, um, some of that could be so that they essentially could say, well, we can figure out if, if the central bank in Europe, in, in, in Frankfurt, were following Meyerson's suggestion, that here's what the value of the euro would currently be in order to make put nominal GDP in Europe on that track. And let's just say the money I owe you is going to be proportional to that number. So we don't need the central bank to do anything. We could run into the contract that will be even as if the central bank was doing that. And, uh, and that's, that's to me is a profound question. To tell I, I think last time I saw him, he said that he thought also the, 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 the balance sheet recession theories was worth thinking about, but it's a pretty good objection. Uh, I think the fundamentals of monetary policy have done that. At the bottom of this slide, I've given one very short attempt to give an answer, which is if, if a start but an inadequate start. If you expect me to issue debt in euros, and I come and ask you to, to, to pay me back in uh, uh, an amount that's fixed in terms of, um, uh, I don't know, uh, uh, Israeli shekels. You know, so, and neither of us do business in, in Israel. You might think, oh, well, maybe Myerson knows something about, about the future of Israeli shekels that I don't know about. Uh, so, so choosing an, an unconventional uh, numeraire for the debt might be interpreted as evidence that the borrower had, that was in that small, that was a surprise, and an updating on a surprise in game theory, you say we can infer almost anything. Such as that maybe I have private information about that this, this is a, a currency that's about to inflate seriously. So the winners first again. So adverse selection, adverse inference can make the, the choice of debt in the rare a game with multiple equilibria. And the focal equilibrium on the money that, you know, is that it's not stupid to say whether it gains multiple equilibria, uh, that the government of, that we, in the country that we live in is going to, uh, that's what governments are for, is to, to help us coordinate our focal equilibrium. Citizens to focus on the on the rare that's the, that's the uh, currency that they control, that their confederation controls anyway. So that's the information economics as an attempt to understand the heart of monetary But I want to, want, want to say I, 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 that's speculative. I have done something this morning that it was not speculative. I want to at least say a little bit about it in this general public lecture. Um, I want to focus for a bit on, on moral hazard in financial intermediation. Uh, moral hazard in financial intermediation has essential role in the heart of any capitalist, of any capitalist economy or any industrial economy. Uh, problems of moral hazard in banking were, were obviously more evident in, in many stages of, re of recent financial crises. The point is a successful industrial a successful economy requires large industrial concentrations of capital that are vastly larger than the in typical individual's wealth. The mass of smaller investors therefore have to trust specialists who do the work of identifying good investment opportunities, but whoever controls the funds of, of millions of other people, thousands or millions of other people, has financial power and may be tempted to abuse it by making sweetheart loans to their own friends or to manipulate the risk profile to their own expected advantage. I have to say, based on arguments like that, that's a moral hazard argument. I had the privilege of speaking uh, a couple of years ago at Ho Chi Minh Academy in Vietnam, and I was happy to say that just that we need, 
either this is a story about why we need rich bankers and or privileged nomenclature that, that, it's not, that somebody, the people who can be in a communist system where you try to abolish, where they tried to abolish private property rights, that still meant you had to have, they had to, somebody had to make the decisions about where the investments were going and whoever did have a lot of power and if it wasn't, if it wasn't rich bankers, it was going to have to be privileged nomenclature because of what we call moral hazard rents, the need when people have this power to abuse Savings of other things. Someone has to make the central planning decisions, whether it's done in a private system or a public system. Uh, they have to be given, they have to think, since they could make themselves rich by abusing the power, they have to expect to live very well when they use, them, when they use their financial power in the appropriate way, making good investments, since they could otherwise get it by, by making sweetheart deals to friends and, uh, and, and impoverishing the investors in the long run. So, Bankers and other financial intermediaries are going to have to borrow much of what they invest, but their incentives to invest well depend on their having a stake in the investments we're going to have to make. So, in the paper that I, well, the paper I presented this morning was called Moral Hazard Credit Cycles, and what I tried to show was that this basic fact that, that we're going to have to allow a certain amount of moral hazard rents in, in a, in, to, to, to those who, who make the investments for us. Say this is not an excuse, this is not an excuse to say oh whatever profits our, our rich bankers are making all that's fine uh, saying that we should not expect to be able to abolish a uh, high a system where uh, those who make major financial, central financial decisions uh, do very well um, in in the paper that I presented the, 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 the paper I presented today was a new paper that was based on an earlier paper in the Journal of the Economy. Moral, moral hazard credit cycles. And in this model, what I showed was how macroeconomic fluctuations could be driven purely by um, moral hazard financial change. And what I'd like to do is briefly sketch the key ideas. And for those of you who were there this morning, it's a model, so therefore you, you probably could do a non technical summary of it. So let me try to do that. The key idea is that it's well understood in agency theory that when people Positions of great power that they could abuse uh, to their own profit, and they're subject to the key of what's called limited liability constraint. They, you can't punish them that much because they could run away. So, if, to give them an incentive to do the right thing, when when we have a good outcome, they have to get all more rewards than a bad. Outcome. That gives them incentive to do the right thing. And if the, how, how they suffer from the bad outcome is limited by the fact that we can't win them. They could, if they, if they're going to be punished, they could run away. They don't. They are themselves born with a large fraction of the economy under their control. They, uh, we're, we're hiring people who are talented, but are not necessarily rich themselves. Then uh, uh, there's, a, there's a, a, a lower bound to how much they can suffer on the net down that side. Therefore, on net, they have a positive probability of getting a lot of money and ultimately lost the public investment. So, to minimize that, that, that the cost of enriching our intermediaries, our, 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 the agents who invest for us, we want them to, to have to work a long time. So that late career, promising late career rewards is the way to minimize the cost to the investors of the moral hazard benefits that have to to their agents. The promise of one big bonus at the end of my life, at the end of my career, can motivate me to good behavior. The one big bonus at the end of my career that's contingent on, on good performance record throughout my career, that can help to motivate me to good, good behavior throughout my long career. So the same bonus can motivate good behavior every year for, for a 40 year career. Whereas if you just hire in the short term, it, you need that bonus, to, that bonus can only, only motivate your good behavior in one year. So this need to invest in agents who have long term career incentives. A long-term career incentive plan itself is a complicated means that the state of the economy today is tied to the state of the economy tomorrow. Long-term career incentive plans themselves, which is a standard result of agency theory, create interesting macro complex macroeconomic dynamics. When the, the state of the economy is going to depend on what contracts have already been signed with people who are mid-career in these long-term incentive plans. When there's a shortage of trusted financial intermediaries, that is to say, we don't have enough people working who, who, whose reputations are still good, 
that investment's going to be reduced and employment may suffer. We could recruit more agents, but the problem is if we could recruit more young agents to, to, to try to expand the capacity of the banking sector, that's going to create a future surplus because the very nature of backloaded incentive rewards means that when they're hired, they're going to be hired in a long-term incentive plan that involves their responsibilities increasing. Because as they get closer to those end of career bonuses, the value, the current value of that end of career bonus gets larger close to retirement. And as it gets larger closer to retirement, they can be trusted with larger temptations. So moral hazard itself gives us a reason to think that people's, to understand why people's uh, responsibilities are expected to grow in responsible positions of management and as in banking or large corporations, as well as large so. And so you can't hire enough young people in a long-term contract to solve the current shortage because you will then have too many young people, too many managers in the future, too many managers meaning the returns to financial intermediation, financial management will be too low to, to pay the, uh, the, the final payments. So recovery is gradual and yields to, to a sequence of booms and recessions. I want to talk about this. That's in one slide the entire summary of the that's how we can't just get no more and stay away from that. There's a picture of the dynamics that I showed this morning. And it's a picture where the, the different stripes in any one year correspond to, uh, uh, to, to invest fractions of aggregate investment that are managed by bank agents at different stages of their career. Uh, and the, uh, uh, the left bar here is the left bar here is, is a steady state. And when, it, when we have insufficient numbers to make this is the oldest one on the bottom, the they get younger say, well, when we've insufficient mid-career uh, bankers, we have to hire a lot of new bankers. Uh, but then they, that, that group, as they, as they get older, they, their, their responsibilities increase, they're crowding out new, new, new hires, and when those guys retire, they have a recession. I, I observed this morning that, uh, that, that this kind of theory suggests that, that the former Soviet Eastern Europe, which in around 1990 built a new uh, financial system uh, with mostly young people, scratch, uh, those guys are going to be retiring sometime around 2025 20, 2030, and there might be in the late, late in the next decade a, a major recession that I'm predicting now emanating out of the former Soviet Eastern Europe. Uh, that's, uh, that's, my, that's my prediction. Please invite me back to Florence. Uh, I have to check it out. Uh, um, let me say a few things fall forward into, into questions of financial regulation. I recently had a paper come out in, in the Journal of Economic Literature Monitor advanced resort. Uh, the informational role of J.P. Morgan 
Famously, in 1907, he sat in his study in the Lotus in the House of New York today. And by the way, when I was at the Max Story House, I bumped into somebody from the Chicago Fed. The next people go to J.P. Morgan's house to pay homage to the place where he, he sat up looking at the balance sheets and reading the documents. We were the, the famous army of, of Morgan men uh, who he trusted us would sit together reading about reading the documents to figure out which banks were worth saving and which were not. They were doing stress tests. And then they would make loans to those institutions the stress test. Um, but notice, J.P. Morgan in 1907 was also widely accused of, 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 you know, of, of, of organizing monopolistic conspiracies against the public. Whether he was or was not, he certainly had the power, and it's no coincidence when a private citizen has the power, is, is acknowledged this, a stress test to, to monitor the, the, the financial uh, uh, quality of a corporation. Um, that once that information is public, it's, it, it, it's, it's got an extra public externality, so it's a natural public good, it's a natural public good. Uh, the, the monitor of last resort, if, if J.P. Morgan is checking them out, then, then once we find out which, JP, which ones J.P. Morgan chooses to save, the rest of us don't have to do the work. So it's a natural monopoly to some extent, uh, being a monitor of last resort, uh, but, but, but being J.P. Morgan with that power uh, meant that he, uh, everybody knew that the the guys, the guys who are allocating credit are going to worry about, about J.P. Morgan in the last resort. Therefore, uh, if he wants to ask them to cut off, off uh, credit to, to firms that are competing with each other for, 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 you know, to create a monopolistic conspiracy against the public, um, then, then maybe he could do that. So obviously, we need a monitor, our monitors of the last resort are, need to be public enterprises. They need to be politically controlled. We need central banks on this monitors of the last resort to be under the public control. Uh, Regulatory requirements that are based on the, the, the Myers Lodgeloff story says that if our regulators are requiring, are, are monitoring bank capital and requiring banks to have more capital based on public information and according to public rules, then the cost of capital should be should be lower. That is, the adverse selection problem when they're issuing new equity should be less. So regulatory requirements that are based on public information can help to reduce the adverse selection problem and sell new equity. Central, more importantly, central banks lending can create considerable confidence in the value of the bank's assets. I'm, I'm very struck that, it, and I, I have not followed this, but, but about a year ago I was seeing that in creating what was the, the European Financial Stabilization Authority, that a, a decision was, was announced at some point that they were going to let the IMF do the work of, of actually in analyzing which countries were the uh, most beneficial most worthy of when they've gotten their financial houses in the appropriate order to be worthy of, 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 of stabilization. Whoever's doing the hard work on the asset of the IMF or of a Eurozone control uh, 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 agency uh, is going to have the informational power and, uh, and, and their lending that is, is based on, has to be a signal that's based on, well, of course, I think I've not been a central. But 
the sense from the Basel perspective that, uh, that we want to try to have the banks make safe investments without requiring quite so much capital. Because from that argument, they created rules that would require banks to have less capital if their investments were nice and safe. Uh, so this was the risk-weighted capital adequacy theory at first, and it became more complicated with, with proprietary models being applied. But the basic idea was that if your portfolio, if, you're, if you're a bank and your investment portfolio satisfies is, is in nice, safe things that regulators will agree are is a safe, safe set of investments, then you, you don't need to sell, you go out and sell new equity. But if it looks bad, then we'll make you sell new equity. And since this is, if this is a non-transparent process, you're going to be suffering selection this and uh, well the problem with that is that it's the owner's equity which is what the owners have to lose when they were investments turn bad which is the basic basic reason that sorry, the basic motivation for the owners who control a bank to try to make safe investments is that they might lose something and what if the, if the investments turn bad what do they lose well they lose the equity that they've invested in so if this when there's less equity, they have less to lose, and then when they have less to lose, then anything else they lose is at the public, the expense of the depositors or the, or the, uh, or the, or the, the general public, or if the, if the deposits are insured. Okay. Um, when we recognize that capital is required, that the purpose for requiring banks, you know, as in any firm, to have a lot of capital in their bank, is to make sure that the owners have an appropriate incentive to take due diligence to manage risks well, then saying, oh, if you do what the regulators think is managing risks as well, uh, then you don't have to have capital. Then you can, borrow, you, you can invest dollar in borrowed funds. When those rules go wrong, well, the first thing that happens, think of something like AAA rated mortgage-backed securities or sovereign debt in the Eurozone, which had the stamp under regular, under regulatory rules as being completely safe, therefore a bank was allowed to invest with borrowed funds. Uh, the first thing that happens is if that's really risky, right, normal investors say that looks a little risky, I don't want to invest it. So the interest rate goes up, the rate of return on that goes up. Then the bankers are given an opportunity to, to, to invest in borrowed funds, and as, if it's as really safe as the regulators say it is, then of course they lose nothing. And uh, then of course it's, oh, it's good, they're just making money on, on, the, on the difference. And if uh, it turns out to be you know, dangerous, well, once you've invested enough, you're already, you're already bankrupt anyway, so, so you have no incentive not to borrow more and invest more. The point is that the, the asking a, 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 the, I want to suggest that having a regulatory theory of what's a safe portfolio <coughs> and allowing our great financial institutions to make uh, investments purely with borrowed funds as long as the, the investments are. are, are stamped as safe, when that theory goes wrong, it actually is the, perhaps the greatest, it has been, I think, over the past decade, one of the greatest sources of systemic risk, regulatory miscategorization of what's a safe asset in these capital requirements has been one of the greatest sources of systemic risk, possibly the greatest source, I would argue, uh, uh, in, in, in the past decade or so. Uh, so, but, but more, more more fundamentally, I should say public officials, are, are, we should recognize from an information and economics perspective, are subject to moral temptations, moral hazard temptations themselves. There is, we should recognize that central bankers are subject to moral hazard temptations. And democratic accountability has to be part of the system. So the point is that regulations which cannot be publicly monitored and or cannot be understood by, the, by, by, by informed citizens uh, may not be credible because there's more than enough money in the financial system corrupt any small number of public officials. Uh, the, the, it's, not a, it's not a coincidence that the greatest uh, financial centers tend to be in democratic countries, where because reliance on, on rule, laws can be better enforced when, when, when millions of people are empowered in democracy. But for that, the, the, the rules have to be enforced based on public information. I should say, I think that's, that's the fundamental reason why monetary policies, monetary policy became, was able to commit itself to we all understood that the strategy was important, and moral hazard in monetary policy making, as long as the central banker was charged with 
both maintaining full employment and price stability, then there was always a trade-off towards making the masters happy by, 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 by worrying less about, it, by, by less about uh, inflation and more about uh, employment becoming more stimulus. A clear, retrospectively judgeable monetary policy is, uh, is, um, is important for moral hazard reasons at the, at the top of the policy-making level, but whether that simple rule is maintaining a 2% inflation rate or maintaining a 4% nominal GDP growth path, uh, those are both red and well, well, well Anyway, let me say, what I've tried to argue is that the Moral Hazard Agency offers a new view of macroeconomic can offer a new view of macroeconomic fluctuations based on changes in moral hazard parameters. Speculate on one more model that I hope some of the economists in the room might, might, might be able to do better in the future. In, in the paper I gave this morning, there was a parameter I called gamma, which was a fraction that an agent could take without anybody noticing it, but he's investing for those agents. Uh, suppose that a shock could change those moral hazard parameters. There's very good reason to think that the history of the last, the last generation, the last centuries, has been characterized by technological improvements that have improved corporate governance controls so that we can invest more and more in larger, more complex enterprises that can achieve more effective production efficiencies without uh, worrying as much about agency rents because we can control those agents better, because we can monitor the agents better uh, with computer technology, for example. So there's every reason to believe that with the passage of time, um, the amount of money we have to allow our privileged managerial elite and financial elite to enjoy at the expense of the rest of society for providing these, these, these critical coordination services may be decreasing and, 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 and therefore we should try to and the public public policy should try to take advantage of it. That's a good thing. But what happens when we get it wrong? Um, I certainly want to suggest that the, the, the differences in, in the differences between developed and undeveloped countries may primarily begin with a better financial system. Uh, the, the ability it's, it's obvious that the poorest countries on, on, on the earth today are countries which were, where they're, are, are severely undercapitalized. We all know in, China, in the rapid growth of China today that, 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 that there have been, it's been obvious for the past several decades, couple of decades, that there were wonderful investments, very productive that we had in China. But that didn't mean that the rest of us who don't live in China could invest there because of the lack of good corporate governance to guarantee that if an American or European invests in, in, in a Chinese company, that he or she will get, that the investor will actually get a fair returns. But what if investors overestimate their, the deterrence against malfeasance? Hey, what would happen then? What would happen if, if it, when I assume that the moral hazard parameters are common knowledge, what if instead they're subject to some uncertainty? Well, the agents who, the financial, the agents who are trusted, whose temptations prove to be more, their temptations are actually greater than we, the investor, outside investors think. They're, going to, they're not going to announce it publicly. They're going to quietly cheat us as best they can, uh, put our money into bad mortgage-backed securities, uh, and, and not tell us about it. Uh, and, uh, and, and it won't be until the losses accumulate large enough that suddenly we notice oops, these guys are cheating us. That we are financial geniuses who can who can, uh, can, can can invest trillions of other people's money and take a tiny fraction of it. No, uh, they, they need. We were underpaying them and they're cheating us. Uh, then there's a sudden loss of trust. In, 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 and I think, often, to me, uh, I, I presented a simple model this morning in which the moral has a parameter for common knowledge, but I want to say to you that I believe a truer model, a true model of a financial crisis would come from a public, sudden public change in the, in the public belief about the parameters the moral hazard problem, about how much capital uh, the, the, for the agents who invest for us need to have, how much skin in the game they need to have. The sudden loss of trust in our financial agents could suddenly, suddenly reduce investment in our economy as we don't know if we can trust them, the agents who need no intermediation until the financial agents could, could accumulate gradually enough capital to, uh, with a shortage of investments, the, the, the most informed guys are going to be investing only in the most productive investments uh, and, and the loss of them, the, the, the somewhat less productive investments hurts real employment and real, real output, but gradually means there's a greater profit margin for those who have the information, and as they accumulate more capital, then they can have more skin in the game and get to trust in the game. Let me conclude by, it's, 
been now almost five years since Paul Krugman published this article in the New York Times Magazine that said a few nasty things about the University of Chicago. And I'm still mad about it, but I don't know if it's not about my talk at your, at your at University Institute with uh, both of them. But more to the point, before crit crit critiquing it, Clearly, that, that concept of the rewards of trust and the problems of the collapse 